Hi, my name is Srinivas and I work for Volcanic. Uh, Volcanic is a social media uh, marketing agency based out of Singapore. Uh, so while I wait for my Mac to come back up, let's speak in How good do we do this? Nice try. I didn't say that somewhere else. It's finally coming up, I think. All right, cool. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, as a marketing agency, uh, we work with some of the big brands in this region um, on a host of different uh, services. One of the uh, functions that we perform for our brands is building social media campaigns, which is basically a different way of saying Facebook apps. Um, and we do this on different platforms, uh, with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and so on and so forth. And also what we do, what we've done over the years is we've gained a lot of visibility into what kind of platforms are needed for building these things, what kind of products can be built on top of it, and we've built those as well and marketed them. So today we have a mix of uh, products which are licensed out to some of our clients. We have platforms which are used by internal developers, and then there's lots of custom apps that are just launched uh, as in how uh, these campaigns are uh, brought forward. Right? So, uh, we actually, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, when, when, unlike a standard tech company, uh, we don't have funding support. So we don't sit and say, we're going to build this and then we're going to sell it. What happens is, the only option for you to build something reusable is to take out time slices out of developers' time, uh, as and when they get free because there's no campaign at that particular time and so on. So uh, what we did was we, our focus on building reusable code has always been towards uh, making sure that we can do it fast and it's flexible enough to fit into uh, any future campaign that might come in because we don't uh, necessarily know what's going to come in the future. <coughs> that said, all the code that we have is all hosted by us and we don't sell code. So we had an internal motivation to build a lot of reusable components and so on. So uh, we've been doing this, uh, Chris, who's my partner in crime sitting uh, back there, and I have been sort of you know, rebuilding the platforms in the last three years. And about five, six months back, we uh, sat down and said, there's something fundamentally broken in some of our platforms, which is that they're all interdependent on each other, they're not you know, service-oriented architecture and so on. So we said, we're going to you know, bring some of these things together, expose it as a REST API, and then you know change our interfaces to them. So when we started working on that, uh, we realized that we've also been sorely missing on all aspects of continuous integration. We were doing continuous integration earlier, but on a piecemeal basis. We thought, let's take this opportunity and bring in some state-of-the-art uh, continuous integration as well. So this is uh, about our experience uh, doing that in the PHP world. Right? So anyway, um, as they say, if it hurts, do it more often. So. You know, uh, doing integration across you know various components in a non-trivial product or non-trivial module might you know get a bit cumbersome. So the idea is to uh, uh, ensure that you know you do it often enough that you automate it. And uh, lazy as we are all as engineers, it makes sense to make it all automated so that it just happens uh, without having to bother about it. Right then. Uh, so if you have not seen this cartoon uh, or comic strip, then this is probably worth watching uh, or reading. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, we all talk about test-driven development, uh, but then it doesn't fit everything that you build, uh, especially not building bridges if, you're, if that's what you're doing. But it works for the software world. Uh, it works for the web application world. It works for us. Uh, and despite the fact that PHP is among the most favorite a tool for building web products, uh, it's quite astonishing uh, how the uptake for continuous integration tools in the PHP world is so little, right? Uh, so quite strange. Right, so uh, we were actually, so I just picked up uh, uh, a picture from one of our product marketing, uh, pro internal product uh, presentations. So we call this new product that we're building called Volcanic Mantle. And Volcanic, all our names of internal products and platforms are named after Volcanic, uh, you know, uh, terminology, which is sort of uh, 
uh, just our way of playing with words. And this layer was sort of going to be between the external applications and the inner core, so that's why we called it mantle, which is the appropriate word uh, in the world of, uh, you know, Vulcanus. Uh, so what we are looking to do is we wanted to do tests, which we were already doing, but we also wanted to package uh, package them, especially the clients that we were planning to give away to our fellow developers or to our you know vendors or third party associates, uh, you know uh, clients for to to talk to our REST API, and we wanted to build all of that in an you know, automated way, build scripts, uh, and we wanted to do auto deploy. So that was sort of you know the four goals that we set out to do uh, with this. So uh, I came from the Java world. I've been I spent six years in the Java world before moving over to Volcanic and starting off our PHP uh, base. So in the Java world, uh, basically unit testing is done using JUnit. You do packaging using Jar or War. You build using Ant or Maven, uh, and you do a lot of continuous integration using Hudson. At least you know, the last uh, continuous integration tool I used uh, was uh, Hudson in the Java world. Uh, I don't know what people are fancying these days in the Java world, so pardon me if my knowledge uh, seems to be outdated. So then uh, we started looking for these solutions in the PHP world. Uh, basically, PHP unit is the favorite for doing unit testing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and for building, uh, we realized that Fing is, seems to be the you know, popular choice out there, a lot of people talking about it, and Fing is a um, natively PHP built product for PHP, so it sort of works together well. Uh, and then uh, packaging, uh, we're still undecided, but we're starting to go with uh, uh, FAR uh, packaging. And then we finally decided to use uh, Hudson again uh, for this integration as well, at least we said, well, let's give it a shot, and if it's too difficult to use Hudson, or if it doesn't fit with our requirements, then we'll come back and revisit it. Uh, our experience has been largely good with all of these tools, so uh, that's why I'm standing here presenting it. Right, so I'll talk first about Fing, and then I'll go to Hudson. Uh, so Fing is, uh, uh, it's, the name comes from Fing is not known. Um, it's basically a PHP project build system. Uh, it's loosely structure, not loosely actually, very closely resembles the Apache Ant architecture. Uh, very much similar, in, you have a build XML, uh, you have targets, targets have tasks, you can mix them all together, you can uh, structure dependencies, uh, so it's very similar. So if you have used Ant, uh, then you will sit right in. How many of you have used Ant, uh, just to get, okay, so there's uh, some knowledge about that. So the philosophy uh, is very much, you know, structure around and simple build files. There's a rich set of provided <coughs> tasks. Uh, you can extend them if you want to. Uh, in our, uh, you know, setup, we didn't need uh, any extensions. <coughs> there is no dependencies required, and actually, you know, setting this up on my Mac as well as on our, uh, you know, uh, build server which runs on Ubuntu. Uh, 1304 was pretty easy, uh, and it works. I mean, it's fairly platform dependent, uh, so that's good. Right then, uh, one of the features that it targets, uh, running tests is, of course, number one, uh, running any kind of tests. It supports PHP unit and simple uh, tests. Uh, you can do file system operations. You can create and delete you know, all your file hierarchies and so on. Uh, you can do SQL execution because if you want to set up your test cases or you know clean up after you're done, then you know you might want to use uh, SQL execution. You can do your CVS uh, and all your source control operations straight from there. And it has tools for creating pair packages as well as FAR packaging and so on. Uh, you can also uh, you know uh, create uh, documents out of here, PHP docs, for instance. Actually, we've, we are doing that right now. I'll show you a bit more. Uh, there's also, uh, there's of course tons uh, of cool features of that. Right, so, um, you know, let's assume that you have a code base out there, you have a few folders where you have your PHP file structured, uh, you have includes files and whatnots, and you want to start off building this into whatever format that you want, whatever test cases you want. So you would start by something like this, you, um, I picked up all of these from our existing uh, code base, so, you know, this fits our requirement and it's all functionally accurate, it works. But, you know, look around for the right combination for you know, your case. 
So um, potentially, the first thing you might want to do is to set up your environment. So you clean up anything that's out there from the past, you know, maybe locked files, uh, old build files, and so on. You first clear that up. Uh, yeah. And then you move on into other targets. Now, you see this line here. It's, it's basically the name of your project. The default here means that what is a target that uh, should be run as default? Uh, so how many of you are used to any kind of build system? Uh, make, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when you run make, uh, you, you can either pass a target or there's a default target that make itself picks up depending on the, uh, the make file. So that's exactly what happens here. Test is what you know, typically I want to run uh, when I don't provide any target. Um, but you, know, you can choose whether it should be deploy or something else that you might want to run. Uh, and in this case, uh, I'm actually uh, doing a simple echo. I'm saying I'm cleaning up this build directory. I'm actually deleting it. Uh, and then I'm deleting some other files that were generated for whatever reasons, and that's how I'm you know, cleaning up the uh, passwords. Then, uh, you know, one of the features that we wanted was lint. Uh, in doing a simple PHP syntax check uh, often is helpful. We've actually seen cases where code ended up in production because somebody missed a semicolon and it broke the site. Uh, very, uh, it happened you know, at least two or three times a year. And we didn't want that to repeat quite that often. So Lint actually helps you. Lint is a, uh, basically PHP Lint is a first class task that is provided as part of uh, Fink. So all you need to do is just give your PHP files and it will run its own, on its own. Uh, and then what I do is I start setting up the directories for my current build. So you know, in this case, prepare uh, is you know, creating the directories that I need uh, for this to work. Now. You might realize that I'm setting up a dependency structure here. I'm saying if lint has to run, then it depends on clean. Clean was a target that was earlier there in the previous slide. So first it cleans, then it runs the lint, then it actually starts preparing. Because prepare then depends on lint. Right? Uh, you can create any graph structure that you want, so long as you don't have cycles. Sorry. Right, so this is my favorite uh, you know, uh, target in, in most projects, which is test. Uh, this seems to be the thing that I run the most at any given time uh, during the day. Uh, target name test depends on prepare. Uh, I'm actually running PHP unit here. PHP unit is again first class supported by Fing uh, out of the box. You don't need to do anything especially for that. Uh, what I'm saying here is that something just making the shake. Yeah, come. Uh, all right. Okay. So uh, I'm saying halt and failure, halt and error. Uh, halt and failure is of course straightforward. If the test fails, don't continue. No point continuing. You know it's broken, so go back and fix it. Um, this is one of the things that you know we want to make sacrosanct, which is that nobody deploys, nobody pushes to um, any environment unless the test case is actually run in, in the environment that they're working in. Uh, halt on error uh, is something interesting. We also don't want to uh, proceed if there is, uh, let's say, a PHP level exception or fatal or something like that where you know, we're trying to access a non-existing object and so on. So uh, this will also stop that. Uh, if there is a test that depended on one of the earlier tests but it could not run because the previous test failed, uh, that's considered a skip and I want to halt even on that case. So I'm being very strict here. And then I want to print a summary. Uh, this file here, bootstrap, is a very interesting uh, uh, you know, uh, attribute of this target. So what I'm doing in bootstrap is um, I'm setting up my test environment. So testing, setting up my test environment could include uh, creating my database, uh, creating my tables, filling in the rows that I want. Uh, restarting cache or clearing up cache. Uh, it could include uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, copying something to a certain location. Or in one of the case, we actually connect through the CLI uh, to another module and get keys which we need to access uh, over the rest uh, because it's all on the same machine. We can actually do that. So Bootstrap is, it's just any PHP file. Uh, you know, Fing expects you to just give a PHP file that can be run using the PHP command line. Uh, 
And it's up to you to decide whether you want to keep you know, other configuration and so on uh, within that. Um, and that's about it. PHP unit will then uh, work. Now, there are a couple of other things that I'm doing here. One is I'm setting the formatter for the output of the test run to be in XML, and I want it to be in this location, utilitest.xml. The reason I do this is that you could potentially uh, process it in a programmatic way, where you, know, you could actually process your failures or success, or even the time taken in some form that is not just merely looking at it. Uh, unfortunately, in the last few months, we haven't really found any use for programmatically doing anything with it, but you know, it's, it's just nice to have the XML printed out uh, in a structured form. And then we basically say batch test everything. Uh, potentially, this could be, say, star.php, in which case everything in, in that particular directory will be run. And uh, you know, on any error, any uh, failure, it will just stop. Right. right. Um, you could potentially pass parameters to it. Uh, you know, any parameter that you want to pass from the uh, time you invoke the uh, thing build uh, that you want to pass to your actual build script uh, is passed with a minus p parameter, and you can access them here using uh, this particular uh, syntax. Uh, in this case, what I'm doing is uh, I want to do a deployment to a particular location. And I'm doing a non-trivial deploy. I don't want to copy everything from one place to another, but you know, I'm selectively choosing only the API folder and a few other files. But of course, this could be all the files in a particular directory. Or it could be all the files in this directory, or it could be anything else. You can structure it accordingly. Now remember here, uh, I've made it depend on prepare, which means that I'm saying if I'm, you know, after I'm done with my tests and everything else, uh, my prepare, my deploy should be something that should happen fairly quickly. Typically what happens is that uh, in a continuous integration environment like Hudson, you would first do your tests, and if the tests succeed, then you will have a follow-up uh, task to do the deployment, and you don't want to slow down that deployment process by having to run all the test cases. Uh, so you can, you can choose uh, the combination you want. Right, so uh, I've run through some, some basic examples. So far, the Target that I showed to you is good enough to actually get you started off on um, a basic project that you might have. Uh, but then I want to uh, talk about some of the advanced uh, features we have used uh, uh, out of thing. One of them is creating a far file. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm using prepare and I'm saying uh, I want this to be the destination file. This is the location from where you need to pick up all the files. You use a compression bzip2, uh, you give all the files, so all these files will be taken up, compressed into bzip2, converted into that file, and kept ready so that you can include it in uh, anything else or distribute it away. Uh, you can also add all your metadata that you want out here. Uh, in this case, I'm not adding much except for you know my email address so that if anybody finds an issue, they can get in touch with me. Uh, by the time this goes to production, this, this should be you know, named to our entire team. Happen as it happen. Right. Uh, so far, any questions? Okay. Good. Um, you know, since PHP 5.4 is it or 5.3, we've had uh, you know PHP development server. The development server is a great option for you to test something uh, in your own computer. You don't need to set up Apache. You don't need to set up Nginx or any other web server. Uh, once you're done creating the build structure, then you can potentially just say PHP minus s location and you have a web server running, and you can start running um, other test cases from there on. So actually we use that. Uh, what we did was, uh, you know, we have a, a target called start server, which depends on prepare. It says uh, run on this uh, host and port combination, a PHP development server, and this is the base directory. So that base directory should have an index.php, and that becomes your landing page of uh, the, you know, the, the setup that you're going to test against. Uh, the advantage of doing this is that you can automate your entire process. So you say your server piece uh, starts off. Uh, you run all your unit tests in the server code. Then you package it, start off the server. So now you have your product running. And then you run your client test cases against that uh, development server, 
So by the end of it, you've tested your server's internals using the unit test. You've tested the interface between the server and the client using the client test cases. So basically, by the time all of this is done, your client far file is pretty much good to be given to anybody who needs to use this particular uh, version of the printer. So uh, we automate this. And uh, well, this is something that's very specific to our uh, uh, product, so I'll, I'll skip on that. Now, interestingly, the spawn equals true means that set it off into the background. Uh, I'm not waiting for a response from this PHP. That's what I'm trying to say, uh, because I just want to keep letting it run in the background while I do the rest of my uh, testing. Uh, as it. Right. Uh, you can also do things like composing from other Fing files. In our case, you know, our code structure is such that we have a server directory uh, with its own build structure, with its own files, and so on. And there is then a client directory, uh, which is which has its own Fing file, uh, build XML. It has its own test cases, and so on. And these two don't share any code uh, because that's the whole idea. Because we want to send the client uh, packaged off uh, to our vendors and our programmers. So now what you can do is you can actually create a build XML on the directory at one level above. And what you can say is that call the uh, build XML targets from these two files. So what I'm basically saying is I'm creating a clean, which is composed of the clean of the client and clean of the server. right? And uh, uh, inherit all is basically a way to say that pass on all the properties, the, the command line arguments down to the downstream uh, fig files so that uh, they can uh, make use of the arguments. And of course, you know, if you don't use a builder XML, then you can give specify the name uh, here. So that's a pretty cool stuff. We've uh, been very happy with, with that uh, option. Right, so the next uh, cool feature that I want to show about is uh, code coverage and test results. How many of you look into your code coverage results? So the background between me and code coverage is that uh, I used to work at a company called Trilogy uh, many years ago. And uh, Trilogy had this guy called Vladimir Rutso, who had then written the uh, only Java code coverage uh, tool out there. The tool was called Emma. And the idea was that you run your tests against your code, but you don't know what percentage of your code is actually being covered by the test cases. You could choose your test case to just test one function and the rest of it is all done. Or one class and the rest of it is all is, you know, buggy and broken. Uh, so the idea of code coverage is to specify a number, a percentage, against uh, your code on which your coverage exists. So uh, actually at Trilogy, we had a rule that nothing gets out of production unless there's 95% code coverage. If you did not have 95% code coverage, we actually had to get the approval of the senior vice president of the department. It was a scary situation to be in. So we actually wrote our code uh, against that standard. So uh, when we started off, uh, when we started off this project, we said, okay, let's throw in code coverage as well. At the very least, we'll start getting a feel of, you know, uh, how much coverage we have, and then maybe we can start coming up with some standards of our own. So uh, in this case, uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically saying set up my coverage, so I'm saying what files I want to include, what files I want to exclude, uh, and I, it says create a database here and keep it there so that after the tests are run, you can match up against the number of lines. So basically I'm, I'm assuming that this coverage setup goes through your files, profiles it in some form so that it can be uh, tested against uh, you know, later on. Then you actually run your PHP unit, which is pretty much the standard stuff. But here, you basically say code coverage equals to true. Now, this won't work unless you have set this setup right here. Right? But once you have it, uh, then you can go to the uh, final section. Ah, this is... OK. Uh, then you go to the final section here, which is uh, in your code coverage report, where you say, uh, Print out the file. Print out the output into this XML and the uh, you know, some report directory so that it can generate all the files. And put it there. It's actually pretty nifty. Um, I'll show you uh, later uh, a file that actually shows uh, how detailed it is and how useful it can be to test your uh, code coverage. Uh, right. 
So then the other thing that we want to do is to generate all our PHP documentation uh, into HTML format so that it can be published to our partners and uh, our internal programmers. So you can do that right from here. You can basically that's just another target. Uh, I say PHP document, I give a title, I give a base location. Uh, I say don't give my source code away just in case you're giving it to somebody who doesn't, you don't want to read your source code to. Uh, you set up a few other, uh, uh, you know, uh, configuration, and you just give the files, and it'll go ahead and do all the hard work for you. Now, I actually use these, uh, you know, two ignore tags to clear off segments that I don't want to be. Uh, sorry, actually, this is the wrong place. It shouldn't be here. It should actually be in the code coverage uh, example. Let's say, let's say, oops. Uh, but anyway, I'll show you the outputs in a bit. Um, this, this is the uh, report of the uh, test cases. I'm sorry the resolution is a bit uh, small, but basically uh, this is a test suite, uh, which is basically one file for me. As you can see, this is the file location. Um, then these are the individual tests, and each test there could be uh, n number of assertions. In this case, I think it's six, and then 10, and then so on and so forth. And it specifies the time it took for it to run. So if you were having very slow test cases, then or your build time is taking too long, then this is the location to check out and see what's causing the delay and fixing them up. As I said, I want to do something programmatically with this, but we haven't gotten around to doing uh, anything uh, with the uh, test results. Uh, the PHP docs looks something like this. Uh, you know, it, it creates a class. It, it tell, uh, it's, this one is an interface, actually. Uh, and then it tells all the files, all the packages, uh, based on the you know, package uh, tag in your PHP documentation. <coughs> It will also tell you all the interfaces, and it links up nicely between methods, parents, known children, uh, and all that. It will nicely connect all of that, and uh, it's quite nice. Uh, this is the code coverage report. Uh, for some reason, if you use packages, and you structure your classes within packages, the code coverage isn't accurate. Because I know for a fact that this package is covered a lot more than what it's showing up here. So at some point of time, we need, I need to sit down and figure out what the hell is going wrong and fix it. But the idea is that this is what you really need to be looking at and saying, look, if this is less than 80% or 60% or whatever is the standard in, within your organization, means that you shouldn't be really pushing this code out to life. Right? Uh, in our case, the code coverage is actually quite good, but somehow the, the numbers aren't getting quite respected here. So that's, that's a bug we need to, uh, bug or configuration issue that we need to put into. Right, so uh, there was a quick introduction into Fing. Uh, there's a lot more on offer. There are tons of uh, tasks available out there. Uh, it's quite nifty, actually. Uh, and I would suggest uh, start off with uh, Fing.info and look through it. The download and setup was also pretty painless for me, so. Uh, Strongly recommend uh, you guys looking into it. Right then, um, so now you have your code, you have a build script, and you've been running the test cases. So now, how do you connect it up with your deployments and server? Automate the process of picking up the nightly builds or hourly builds or whatever it is, and pushing it to your uh, staging server or whatever you know uh, server that you might have where you want to integrate it. So. Uh, Hudson is a tool that's been around for quite some time. Uh, we use Hudson. Hudson and Jenkins are, I think, from the same uh, source code, if I'm not wrong. They are ports of each other. I think Hudson was there before Jenkins got pulled off later. Um, and they're in the same family. Most of the tool looks very similar. Most of the configuration looks very similar. So if you want to use Jenkins, go ahead and do that. Uh, I don't see much of it. So the philosophy is quite simple. You want to build it all the time. Uh, when you, as developer, do your stuff on your machine and you check in, you assume that it works with everything else. But sometimes what happens is somebody else might have checked in something that will conflict. Or you go out in the night, you have created the database table that is needed for this test to work, but you forgot to push it to the you know, build server and the build breaks, which means you need to go and put that you know, create, data, create table statement somewhere or whatever it is. I mean, you, you basically need to ensure that uh, the build happens correctly on the build server 
uh, for you to have uh, some amount of trust that it all works together. Because your environment is obviously not the most optimal environment for it all to work. In my case, it's even more the case because uh, I use a Mac here uh, at the office, but our servers are all uh, Ubuntu, and we need to push uh, our code to Ubuntu, so maybe there's a dependency issue, maybe there's something, some particular module might behave uh, wonky. So uh, that's the uh, philosophy. Hudson uh, is very simple, very straightforward. Uh, it's very easy to install, straight out of the box you can install it. Very easy to configure. It's very good for reporting. You really have a very good idea about how your builds are working. It gives you a historical perspective. You can actually go back and say that you know, for the last six months, we've had this build performance, we've had these many successful builds versus these many <coughs> unsuccessful builds, so you have a lot of really uh, good reporting information out there. You can actually use this to publish your documents, which PHP docs or code coverage or uh, test uh, output uh, onto a dashboard, which can be used by decision makers or maybe your you know, product managers and so on downstream to make decisions about how things are going. And the good thing about Hudson is it, it's extendable. There's a published uh, plugin structure uh, which other uh, you know, technology providers have act actually given out plugins uh, for Hudson to work out with their uh, respective uh, solutions. Right, so one of the first things that you need to do as soon as you set up your Hudson is go and change the security settings. Hudson by default work comes without security and which means that if you go ahead and configure your build task, Hudson is going to start pulling all the code from your servers and bringing it onto your machine. And it becomes essentially a free tool for any of your you know, uh, uh, attackers to go and pick up all the code, or basically it's a big compromise. So the way to fix it is that you start by configuring your security first. Now, Hudson provides a variety of security options. You can use your normal username password. You can use uh, LDAP if you're internally using an LDAP server. Uh, we actually have our own LDAP server, so we've actually configured it. The username password for that is in that little advanced uh, uh, you know, uh, section. And you can actually do role-based configuration. So in this case, uh, you know, role underscore Hudson admins, role underscore Hudson users is actually configured on LDAP. So we've created two groups and you know grouped our users into those two groups. And based on those two groups, we have different permissions. So Hudson admins and can obviously do anything, but the Hudson users, all they can do is just read the job uh, data and run uh, new test cases. That's all they can do, they can do nothing else, right? And we have two non-LDAP users, uh, just in case our LDAP server comes off or whatever, we should be able to go into the server and you know bring it back up, uh, up and running, right? So that's basically uh, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do, uh, set up your LDAP and go to it. The next thing you want to do is to go to your plugin manager. Hudson already has an existing plugin manager. It's already connected to its own repositories where the plugins exist. So it's very much like an app store. Um, you go to the app store or plugin store and just pick up the plugins you want. In our case, uh, the, you know, the three things on the top are the most important for us. One is we wanted to publish some of the HTML we were generating, like the PHP doc, docs and the code coverage output and so on. Uh, we wanted that. We wanted Fing, because we were using Fing for building. And we wanted the Git plugin, because we were actually uh, storing our code in, in Git. Right then. Uh, actually, let's just try and set up a job here uh, through a few screens. Uh, you know, this is, this is our product name, so I just created a job name. Uh, there is no cascading job, which means after this job is done, that's it. I don't want anything else to happen. Right now, I can change the configs later. And you can do things like discard old builds. So if you are building every day, three times, four times, ten times, then you can choose to discard the old builds. Uh, in my case, I'm actually keeping it just in case I want to go back and look at a particular test report or you know a particular uh, class file or output or whatever. Uh, and uh, you know, there's also an option to execute concurrent builds if necessary. Uh, it's generally a bad idea to run concurrent builds because you might have state, whether it's database, cache, or memory state, that can collide with each other. So it's strongly preferred not to do it, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. Right, uh, the next thing you want to do once you've set up your name uh, is basically to go and pull the code. So in this case, it's fairly easy. We give our 
uh, you know, Beanstalk app uh, account. Again, in the advanced section, we have set up uh, SSH keys which are needed for you to pull the code. Uh, you can also give your username and password if that's what you use. Uh, and once you do this, uh, you need to provide your uh, branch. Uh, normally, it's the master, but you can you know, build any branch you want. And once you have given these two, you're pretty much done. Your code will start getting pulled. Right, the next thing you want to do is to decide how you want to build or when you want to build it. Do you want to build it uh, after some of the particular job is done? So if you have multiple jobs, you want to probably you know, structure that into a workflow. Or you want to say, you want to trigger it through some script. Maybe you have some other programmatic solution based on which you want to trigger it. Or you say you want to uh, pull your source control uh, management, uh, pull, pull it in. In my case, I've actually set it up to a schedule of every five minutes. So the idea is that I say, check my Git every five minutes. And if you see a change, start building right then. Right? So at any given time, after I do a Git push, there is only a five minute gap between it starting off. Uh, the reason we had to do this was that our uh, Beanstalk app, which is our Git provider, has plugin support to call a remote location. And in fact, using the trigger builds remotely, we could have called Hudson's build from the code push. The problem was we were also using that to update our base camp. We were also sending the, you know, the state of the, uh, of the task to base camp, and these two were colliding with each other. So we thought, okay, let our existing system be in place, let it keep pushing the updates to base camp. What we'll do is we'll uh, start pulling uh, from Hudson every five minutes. Uh, and then, once it comes in, you tell it what to do. So in this case, I've told it to invoke a fin target. And since I'm always interested in test, I've given it test. In advance, I pass a few parameters, uh, the ones that I was showing you earlier, which is deploy location or whatever else that you might have. You can pass that in advance and your thing on top You can add other build scripts. So if you want to say, first prepare, then test, or test, and then deploy, or whatever it is, you can do all of that uh, right here. Right, um, here is where I'm doing other stuff. So after uh, you know, my build is done, I said deploy it to a particular location. This is our you know, test website, which is where we want to send all our uh, you know, uh, build product. So I've, I'm triggering this product, and I'm choosing not to trigger it if it's unstable, which means if my tests have failed, then I don't want it to be deployed. I want my deployment to stay at the last stable build. Uh, and then I say publish all my JUnit test report to a particular location. I'll just show you the output. And I say publish the HTML reports uh, in this structure to these two locations. So these are the titles that come up on the dashboard after this time. And then this last section says that if there was a failure, then send me an email uh, so that I can go in and fix it or you know, whoever needs to be notified is notified so that they can go fix it. You can also decide to send it to the individuals who broke the code. So if you're using LDAP and your LDAP username are mapped to email addresses, then you're good to go. If it breaks, then it sends off a mail to the person who broke it, saying fix it, as well as one email here, which could potentially be your you know, team email address or your boss or your release guy or whoever it is, uh, whatever is your uh, internal structure. Right. So this is the output. Um, typically, uh, you know, you, if you're test, if you're developing code and you're increasing your test count, so this this graph should always be going up because you're adding more tests. In this case, I'm, you know, running about 80, 81, 82 uh, test cases. Uh, it it maps it to the build number. It tells you whether you were successfully able to build uh, all along or not. Um, here is the build history. The recent build history uh, tells you the number, where it ran, and what was the state. For any given run, you can actually look at the console output. You can click on this and see what you would have seen as if you were running it on your own terminal. Um, and you, you can also see the broken code. Now remember that two HTML published that I did, the code coverage as well as the, uh, you know, the PHP documentation, those are right here. So for any build, it's right there. So I can click on it and go and check out you know, the code coverage for that particular build. Uh, if I want to build right now, I can click on it and say build now. Uh, maybe there was some you know, transient error, maybe something else was broken somewhere else, you fixed it, so you just go in and say build now and hopefully uh, it will all work. 
And then uh, there's a handy link here to the uh, downstream jobs uh, that need to run. And this little green says that even the downstream uh, job was successful. So basically says the whole run was successful. And here is the latest test failures link. It says there were no failures. So you can look at all that. Uh, actually, you can't clearly see this, but it says git polling log. This would have told you uh, when all did Hudson go and poll your git and whether it found any changes or not, and you know what was the build number against which uh, it triggered the change. Just to tell you what a console output might look like, uh, this is potentially the kind of console output. It's very much similar to what you would see on a terminal. In fact, if you if you click on the console output while you're still the build is still running, you'll see a handy little waiting thing that just waits for the output from the next thing and the next thing, and then just keeps filling up. Uh, very handy to troubleshoot if your build is broken. You know exactly where it broke and what was the output till then. So you can go in, find the issue, fix it, and you're pretty much uh, all done. Right. Uh, I think I am done. So. Uh, Questions, suggestions, um, that's a link to our blog. Uh, we do blog about stuff, but you know, on the blog we're a little more uh, uh, directed towards DevOps rather than uh, towards coding and coding best practices, but that's where we are. Any questions? Um, how does writing, because in PHP unit, PHP unit you can write your own uh, XML file that defines all the tests, uh, coverage, and all that stuff. Yeah, you can integrate it straight away. So instead of writing that PHP XML, you PHP XML, you write it in. No, you can use the PHP doctor XML as well with this. Okay. You can when you're invoking the PHP unit, you can say pick this configuration from here, and uh -huh. it'll just run it from there. Right. Of course, you could also construct it here if you want to, but you know you have the choice of doing it. Right. Uh, Previously, I used Fring. They were you were only able to create you uh, create reports using one kind of report generator. Are there other uh, other, other other report generators uh, available now? Uh, the when you search for that, there seems to be a lot of options. When you try to get it up and running, it's sometimes frustrating because one thing doesn't work. There's an error on the other thing. Um, I'm 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 actually more desperate to get my code to work rather than worry about the reports. So actually, many of the reports section could be optimized when there is somebody spending a little more quality time on it. So I'm, I I think it's gotten a lot better now. Uh, but again, specific Any other questions? Yeah. Can we deploy our changes to the database? Uh, I see some of my code. I created a new table for I uh, change some of the code. So can you apply those changes to the uh, to the to the working database? Yes, yeah. can. Uh, you can do that uh, just using a normal SQL task. Is uh, you give the host username, password, and all that, and you just execute it. Uh, alternatively, you can always decide to call uh, internally a PHP or a Bash uh, command, which will then go ahead and do it. So you have both the options. You can either do it directly. SQL is supported uh, by default, or you can use a PHP or a Bash script to go. So, um, for every build, thing is thing configuration is being called by the Hudson mm -hmm. every time you build. Every time Hudson builds, yes. Um, Hudson goes and pulls your code and looks for the build.xml, looks for the target that you mentioned, calls the target in build, uh, Fing, and then you know Fing will do all of that. And once Fing completes and if it's successful, then Hudson will take back control and do all the post build jobs. on another server in your office, is it? Or no, is Hudson, it? Hudson, okay. So our uh, infrastructure is all based on Amazon AWS. So Hudson server also is one of the servers okay. in uh, running in uh, the data center in, in AWS. Okay. 
and that is built to the same specifications that we use for the servers on which we run the actual production code. Nice. Same uh, version of Linux, same version of all the packages and so on. So for me, it's not practical for me to keep that on my computer, so I want to outsource that off there and do that. Uh, a good example is that if you use memcache, memcache restart uh, on uh, Linux, you can actually send a flush all command and it will clean up. On Mac, I don't know if you have ever tried it, flush all doesn't work. So on the Mac, you need to actually stop and start the server. So then these are things that I've all you know, sort of uh, automated uh, part of the build. Uh, what I do is for this environment, I call you know uh, start and stop the memcache. But when it's run into the build, in that environment, it actually you know, sends a flush all command to clear the cache. Uh, on the productions of, uh, you can only maintain one instance of the database, right? Can I correctly say that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, uh, what I do is, uh, I have maintained a config file for each environment. For my desktop, for the development, uh, for the build server, and for the production server. So what then happens is that you can call Hudson and Fing with specific parameters. So you can basically say that when you're running on my Mac, you say fing minus d environment equals to desktop. So that way it runs with the environment that I've configured on my local machine. And then when you go to build, it runs with a different set of config and then it goes to run. But you are, uh, I remember you mentioned that Hudson can maintain a number of previous builds. Yes. But those previous builds will be running, will be assessing the most. No, they, 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 the they're not previous. running. They have finished okay. and the state has been propped up. Okay, I see. I see. So they ran it successfully, all your test cases ran, then that build is now basically dormant. Oh, so what Hudson will do is it will collect all the meta information like how many tests ran, what time did it run, all of that, keep it in their records so that it can build these charts and graphs and all that. And you could go back and refer to it. So uh, a good example is that maybe you put a code that slowed down some process. You want to look into it, but you don't know which build it was actually running fine. You can actually click through and say, hey, in this particular case, the test case was running in just two seconds. Now it's taking 20 seconds. That's where the change happened. And then you can go back and fix it. Right. I've actually done that once. <laughs> I added a sleep uh, one to test uh, something, and then I forgot to take it out. And thankfully, it didn't go to production. So uh, we found it before that but, uh, happens. <laughs> Anything else? You say you have um, your production, you got your deployment, um, and you've got your Mac. Right. So you install it in your Mac OS. You don't use an uh, environment like Vagrant or some VM. No. Oh. I install the 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 thing on my computer. Okay. But I don't install Hudson. Hudson is all on the build server. I see. I see. Because I, I find the Mac environment very different from because I, I also work on Ubuntu, uh, on AWS right it's really different so right uh, I use Vagrant I, I find it really what does Vagrant do I'm Vagrant uh, works with uh, VirtualBox okay uh, it's command line it sets up um, okay. the environment for you so is it a virtual environment running on your desktop yes correct but what yeah, it does is that it can link um, your actual folders to the virtual folders yeah, so you realize that yeah. my Mac is already slowed. And this Mac is like two months old, right? It's already slows down every time I try to bring it back from sleep. Uh, uh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I installed Vagrant, I saw a huge uh, improvement in the performance. Oh, is it? it actually because you isolate everything inside the Vagrant environment. Ah, OK. Yeah. So the actual uh, Mac operating system that's not, uh, yeah, that's not in the, yeah. running behind. So I made a mistake. I installed one MongoD, MongoDB in my Mac. Ah. And I, I, it was impossible to shut down with the demo. Right. right. So the, the, the process was always there. So so How many of you actually use Eclipse here? Oh, okay. So you uh, uh, do you run background in uh, Eclipse in background or you write outside? No, Eclipse in ID. Okay. So, so this is just for building and running. No, this actually on the terminal. Okay. So you open the terminal. Okay. And you can write the command background up. So ah. you open the machine. Okay. So this actually creates a new IP on your local, um, oh. on, on your like one nine two one six eight one two. Okay. And you can put on your host files to point there for your domain names for your. Actual oh, okay, okay, okay. So th this thing gives you the vir virtual instance of a server on Ubuntu on your machine. Okay. So you put there MySQL, Nginx, everything. 
So when you finish the development, you just shut down the server and everything is back to normal. Oh, okay. You isolate everything there, that's a good thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but you know, I haven't done that yet, so. I think there are some uh, links on the PHP group on Vagrant. Uh, just have to scroll back. So sure. Also, Michael. Uh, Michael is a Vagrant expert. Ah, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 yes we do. oh okay. Nah. Cool. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All you can check it out offline. Yeah. <laughs> cool. uh, anything else? All right, good. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, and the, the shameless self plug follows, which is that if you're interested in working with us, uh, then feel free to connect with us, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as well as uh, you know, this is what you